As we heard in the reading, we hear what we want to hear. And sometimes our preconceived notion of what we expect to hear gets in the way of what we actually have out there to hear. Jesus had a pattern of ending his parables with the phrase, you who have ears to hear, listen. He was essentially saying, if you, uh, well, he was essentially saying, you all have ears, use them, pay attention. But he was also suggesting that there is another way to listen. If you are willing to put in the work, because sometimes we have obstacles that get in the way of hearing and understanding. You who have ears to hear, listen. Now let me pause here at the beginning and uh, acknowledge the ableism in our language. Our vocabulary is saturated with analogical references to our senses as if everybody has full access to, for example, their seeing and their hearing. With the reverse suggestion that a disability indicates intellectual deficiency. Do you see what I'm getting at? Do you see it? Do you hear what I'm saying? Sometimes I can't stand it. Do you understand? <clears throat> I'm not going to spend this whole sermon unpacking our language <clears throat> as if we're terrible people and we need to stop talking. Instead, I'm going to deconstruct what is behind all of this language. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about how we take in information about truth and reality, how we make meaning of it, and what gets in the way. Let me start with the story of magenta. Actually, to do that, let me first start with the story of yellow. I trust you are all familiar with the basic concept of color, that it's a function of the waves of light. When we, when we look at a rainbow or white light through a ref, that is refracted through a prism, right, we get the distinct colors of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And there wasn't a vote about putting them in that order. There, there wasn't like a, an artist centuries back who set convention for the colors to be in that order, no. They're based on that order by physics. Light travels in waves. And, uh, at the, at a, and so based on the rate of the wavelengths, the different colors show up. That's physics. So let me shift for a moment to biology. Our eyes receive these photon waves of light and we have uh, specific types of light and color receptors, rods and cones in our eyes that then send the signals to our brains so we can see color. We have three types of cones for color vision, red, green, and blue. It's actually a lot more complicated than that, but it's close enough of a description for the purposes of our story this morning. All the color we see is based on the blending our brains make from input received through our eyes, through the three cone color, color cones uh, that receive the photons of light entering our eyeballs. Now at this point, you're probably thinking, isn't this supposed to be a sermon? <laughs> it sounds like a high school biology class, to which I say, bear with me, this is actually really cool to which you're probably like, okay, this is Douglas. And he, he does like to take us on little stories to make an interesting point, keep going. Thank you, I'm gonna keep going. So there are three kinds of color receptors in our eyes, but we all know about the seven, the, the spread of seven different colors in the rainbow. And that's not even to mention shades of the same color. My wife keeps telling me that a blue shirt and a blue tie don't go together if they're not the same blue. So how do we see all these different colors when we only have three kinds of color receptors? The answer is our brains are amazing at blending sensory information into coherency. Take yellow, for example. 
we don't have a, a photo receptor cone in our eyeball for the color yellow. But we still see yellow. Now yellow does have a very distinct brain wave, uh, a white uh, wave pattern, right? Uh, it, so technically, because we don't have the color receptor, we can't see it, but our brains receive that wavelength information from our red cones and our green cones and interpret that information as yellow. In fact, most of the color that we see in our, by our brains is a blend and interpretation. So yellow is not all that remarkable. Interesting side note, <clears throat> there are some animals such as goldfish who have yellow cone receptors. But hold on to your socks while I tell you about magenta, okay? The color magenta doesn't have a distinct wavelength in the spectrum, but we still see it. You remember how at the uh, top of the rainbow, you have red and the bottom is violet? Well, what color do you get when you blend red and violet? Fuchsia or magenta, or some other name that we call that mix of red and violet. Today, let's just use magenta. On the color wheel, an equal mix of red and violet produces magenta. On this one, it, it's called red-violet, but you know, just let's call it magenta for today. But color is not on a color wheel in physics. In physics, it's on a spectrum. With red at one end and violet at the other. With red having those long, deep wave, wavelengths and violet having much shorter wavelengths. Our photoreceptor cones receive this information with corresponding wavelengths for different colors. Red's wavelength is wide, violet's wavelength is narrow. They don't meet, they don't blend. There's no wavelength for the color magenta. Magenta doesn't exist. And yet, we see magenta. So magenta does exist. Ta-da, science. Now let me tell you why I took us all on this long, geeky science ride. Our brains are amazing. They look for patterns. They fill in gaps. They make interpretations. The blue bottle butterfly has 15 different kinds of photoreceptors. They don't need to fill in a lot of gaps. Their brains don't need to work extra hard at interpretation. Their eyes have 15 different types of photoreceptors. We have three. Our brains have to work hard to figure out what we're seeing. Our brains are very good at this. If you zoned out during my little digression into eyeball biology, the short version is this. The world out there is filled with things to sense and perceive. Our eyes take in a certain limited amount of this information. And then our brains find patterns, fill in the gaps, and produce an amazing interpretation of the world around us. The part that I wanna focus on this morning is the way our brains find patterns. We do this in so many ways. This is not just with our eyeballs and color, not just the physical world revealed to us through our senses and through science. We're also talking about how we understand uh, social and political issues like the economy or systemic oppression. It's about our spirituality and our faith. It's about how our values and convictions and sense of hope come into existence. The world out there is filled with things for us to experience. We take in a certain limited amount of this information and then our brains make, uh, they, they fill in the gaps and find patterns and produce an amazing interpretation of the world around us. Some people say the thing that makes us most human is that we make tools, that we make and use tools 
or that we're rational, that we think, or that we love. Now I can hear an argument that what makes us most human is that we tell stories. We see patterns and discern meaning out of what is happening around us. We create stories about it. We are meaning makers. Even if something that we say is something we had to make up, like magenta. We can make meaning out of the thinnest set of information. We see patterns and reach conclusions. Again, this isn't just the physics of color. This is about falling in love and reaching for justice. We have experiences. We look for patterns. We fill in gaps and find meaning. Think about why it is sometimes good and sometimes not good to be so good at seeing patterns that may or may not be real, like magenta. I was reading an article by a by a nutritionist with a pattern for how we form habits, uh, Chris Sandel in his piece, How Our Mind Fills in the Gaps writes this, it makes sense to our brain that for our brains to make assumptions or connections. These are shortcut ways for us to understand the world and not be overwhelmed by information. Basically, beliefs, help us quickly and easily make sense of the world we live in. He goes on to say, and if we think about it from an evolutionary perspective, it helps to explain this even more. Imagine you're an early human living in nature and you're walking around in the forest and you hear a rustle in the bushes. From a life or death perspective, it makes sense for us to make the connection that a rustle in the bushes equals a dangerous predator. So Sandal goes on to talk about how we became so good at committing uh, what are called false positives. If you assume the noise is a predator and it's not, that's a false positive, but you're, you still survive that situation. Right or wrong, you survive if you respond as if the danger is real based on the limited information that you've received. If you ignore the pattern and don't make the connection, fail to respond, as if it's dangerous, and then it is, then you don't, you don't survive. Evolutionarily, our species passed down the lesson to learn and to lean in to false positives. So as a species through the ages, we look for patterns and we respond accordingly. Sandel says, this is known as patternicity the tendency to find meaningful patterns in both meaningless and meaningful data. So what's the fix for this glitch in our system? How do we resolve this problem of only hearing what we want to hear or assuming something is correct when in fact it's not? How do you deal with it when our preconceived notion of what we think we heard gets in the way of what is actually there to be heard. Yeah, you're not gonna be surprised when I say listening. It's good to check in with yourself regularly and ask, is this real? What is the evidence? Am I hearing only what I want to hear? Am I really listening? We see meaning in patterns. That's what we do. We find stories of importance in the meaningless and meaningful data. What patterns are you seeing? Is there really a God? Am I falling in love? Did that person just say something racist? Is Antifa really a socialist plot by the deep state? Are we on the road to becoming a fascist nation? Why do cats and dogs not get along? Is magenta even a real color? Jesus said, you who have ears to hear, listen. In this hyper-political season, what stories are you uncovering? What evidence supports those stories? Is it real? Maybe it is. I, last week I made the point that truth matters. 
Today, I'm saying be skeptical. Am I repeating myself or contradicting myself? Take the time to stop every now and then and be curious about your beliefs, your convictions about the stories you tell yourself of who you are and who some other people are. Be curious about your stories. They may be true. Truth has never suffered by doubt. Truth rises when we let it. And there is always an element of interpretation going on in the mix, like magenta. And if this is overwhelming, if, if there is just too much coming at you and your three simple photoreceptors are overwhelmed, remember that you can step back and just focus on one thing at a time. A simple weed, a seed pod, a sandy wash. Our faith tradition has always been open to doubt and skepticism. We are a curious people. Stay curious. Strive to stay open to the challenges about your preconceived notions and about the patterns you think you're seeing. Our world is made of stories. Let us be mindful of that part of reality as we work to build the beloved community in a world without end. May it be so.